Is Bitcoin's volatility a deal breaker? Well, I just lived in El Salvador for the past six months, and most of you will know El Salvador was the first country to make Bitcoin legal tender. And I'm going to let you know about what my experience in El Salvador was like on the ground and whether Bitcoin's volatility over the past 12 months has in fact impacted its adoption at the grassroots level. Hope you enjoy this one. In El Salvador, tell us a little bit about um, being in El Salvador and the impact what they're doing as a government, you could say, when it comes to the world of, of Bitcoin and more. Yeah, so El Salvador, uh, obviously, for anyone who doesn't know, they're the first country to actually make Bitcoin legal tender. So they did that in 2021. Um, it's been about a year now since uh, El Salvador has been using Bitcoin as legal tender and their economy is thriving. I think GDP is up something like a 10 or 11% in a year for El Salvador, and that's massive. And for most people would actually, um, would probably not know, but El Salvador is a very poor country. So I think the average wage is something like 300 US dollars a month. So these people are really poor. 70% of the people here in El Salvador don't have bank accounts. And now um, since Naib Bekele, the president of El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender, now instantly everyone in the country who has access to a smartphone um, now essentially has a bank account. They have a Bitcoin bank account. Um, so I think um, remittances is something that's very big in El Salvador. So I think it makes up something like 20 or 30% of the country's GDP. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, there's actually more El Salvadorians living outside El Salvador than there is living inside El Salvador. So it's a very poor country. People want to get out. They go and make money in the United States and they send money back home. And that's obviously called remittances. Uh, the issue with El Salvador um, is their country is pretty much ran and taken over by these predatory banks like Western Union. So if you try to send $100 from the US to El Salvador, um, essentially the banks take like a 30% cut out of that $100. Wow. So for somebody who's only earning $300 a month and you're getting slapped a $30 charge or a $30 fee on every $100 transaction, um, it's obviously, it's taking a big bite out of the available money you've got. So Bitcoin instantly fixes that cross-border payments that are instant, pretty much near uh, near free. Um, and obviously there's no banks in the middle. So it's a beautiful thing what Bitcoin's doing in El Salvador. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk about the fees. I've noticed since all the upgrades in the Bitcoin network, the fees have come right down. Mm. I know it used to be generally a $30 fee to send Bitcoin and mm. everyone's like, it's old, it's slow, it's not there. <laughs> Transactions have got way faster now. Sure, with blockchain, there's always some times where it can slow down a little bit, but I've noticed the upgrades with that. And so with what El Salvador have brought in, um, it's been really, really powerful. And one thing that, can you can you explain to like the newbies or the people caught in there, oh, but Bitcoin price is down, El Salvador has been buying the price high. Um, can you just explain a bit of why that's probably not even a relevant conversation right now? Um, I know from my understanding, but can you yeah talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so essentially Bitcoin's very volatile. Um, Bitcoin is the best performing asset over the past 12 years, um, but it's also seen something like five 80% corrections or crashes uh, in, its, in its history. So um, Bitcoin's a young technology. It's only adopted by somewhere between one to 5% of the world. So nobody understands what Bitcoin is. So essentially what you've got is um, when people see the price go down a little bit, they sell it. They, they're, they're known as the weak hands or the retail money. So the retail money was buying Bitcoin last year when it was 40, 50, 60, $70,000 a pop. And when they saw China ban Bitcoin or when they saw the equity market sell off, they all raced to sell their Bitcoin because they're scared of a global recession that's coming down the line. So uh, Bitcoin's very volatile. Bitcoin will continue to be very volatile for the next five or 10 years. Um, I don't actually think Bitcoin's gonna not be volatile until it's somewhere, until it's worth 10, 20 or $50 million a coin. I always like it when you put a prediction in there. It, it gets the it gets the uh, energy going. One thing I love, and it's still to the point of um, uh, why I feel El Salvador's move. It doesn't matter where they've bought in and their buy-in prices and stuff like that. Is it's it's a long-term play for them. This is we're talking about a country, a third-world country that you, you said is poor, and you gave some great facts at the start there of one of the reasons why they're poor and. Bitcoin really takes a lot of the power away from the, the banking cartel's control on um, how a country, <laughs> this is the thing. It's like they can control a whole country through their monetary um, system. And the other thing is too, is the US dollar as a measurement tool for something like Bitcoin. I always say to people, 
I'm like, well, yeah, Bitcoin's all time high was like 69,000 US or whatever. Is it 20,000 US today or 19 and a half? Yeah, but in that time, that printing machine for the money from all the, the banking cartel has been running off its fucking, it's been like drawing all the power from all our solar panels across the planet because we really need them apparently going forward. There's another tangent. <laughs> Draining batteries everywhere and nuclear plants are shutting down because of it. No. Um, <laughs> but as a measurement tool, the US dollar is just a fucking joke, really, to even compare mm. the price of when Bitcoin was all-time high to now. Like, I tell people that, well, Bitcoin's actually been really fucking stable. Like I say, it's the best-performing asset. If you take away the US dollar in its current form as a measuring tool and you go, well, back then, if the same amount of US dollars was here now there's not there's 80 percent more or probably more if that was the same the price of bitcoin would probably be pretty similar mm. if not probably it gone up so the nine and a half thousand dollars is the value of how many bitcoin or how many satoshis or whatever you've got so el salvador have been accumulating <laughs> from what i see and they've been buying the dip as well steve 100 um... dollar cost averaging i t i like not financial advice on any of this here <laughs> but i I show people the dollar cost average. Countries are fucking doing it because it works. Mm. So you add right. into that. Oh, yeah. I completely forgot to mention the El Salvador thing. Um, so obviously, I think Naib Bekele first started buying Bitcoin at around 45,000 US dollars. So for the Australian listeners, that's about 60,000 Australian dollars, maybe 65,000. And obviously, the price of Bitcoins, it, it crashed all the way down to it's, it's pretty much at 20,000 US dollars now. A lot of people are saying, oh, Bukele's destroyed um, the Treasury Reserves of El Salvador. Well, there's a couple of things to kind of add in there. Like, Bukele didn't actually buy that much Bitcoin based on the amount of Treasury Reserves the country has. I think he only put something like 1% of the Treasury Reserves um, into Bitcoin. I don't know the exact figures off the top of my head, but it's very small. Um, and Bukele's been buying all the way down. So I saw when Bitcoin was at $19,500, Bukele bought another uh, 10 or $20 million of Bitcoin. So he understands the long-term potential of Bitcoin and he's buying up as much as he can. Um, and then on the other really good point you raised about, um, yes, Bitcoin's down 80%, but you also need to track what these other currencies are losing in a year. So the US dollar has lost 15% of its purchasing power against goods and services over the past year. And then a lot of these other smaller currencies, they're lost even more than that. So, for example, um, Argentina, I think yearly inflation in Argentina is something like 90% right now. So the Argentinian peso has just lost 90% of its value in the past 12 months. They don't really care so much that Bitcoin's down 70% because it's actually more stable than their local currency. Same thing in Sri Lanka. Like, obviously, they're, they're not a small country, Sri Lanka. They have a population of 25 or so million people, but they're living for inflation of 100%. And the government has enforced massive capital controls on all the bank accounts in Sri Lanka. So you've got the option, hold a Sri Lankan rupee that's down 100% in a year and you're subject to capital controls, or you can hold Bitcoin. Yes, Bitcoin's down 70%, but Bitcoin also doesn't have any capital controls and there's no banks or governments that can um, tell you what to do with your Bitcoin. So um, that's a great point you raised. People need to kind of look at the recent Bitcoin correction um, in, in, in the perspective of what these other currencies around the world are doing, because we're seeing the highest inflation levels that we've seen in 50 years all across, not just emerging markets like Argentina and Sri Lanka, but also in Australia, the US and the UK. I'm sure we're going to get into the UK shortly, but um, the central bank um, in England, the Bank of England, is uh, resorting back to quantitative easing, which means they're just simply printing money while inflation is above 10%. That's right. We should get the money printed meme up. But um, I think, yeah, I think that's a great kind of point you raise about Bitcoin. And you do need to look at look at it in the broader picture of what, what else, what's the other currencies doing. Okay, that is all I've got time for you guys today. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I am actually planning on making more content surrounding El Salvador. It is one of the most common questions I get over on Twitter. My DMs are absolutely flooded all the time with people from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and especially Europe wanting to escape. And they're all asking me, okay, Luke, what's El Salvador actually like? I hear it's one of the most dangerous countries in the world. And of course, a little bit of housekeeping about this video. If you missed the memo, 
I am posting all of my videos as soon as they're made over on the Money Matters YouTube channel. That is obviously built and powered by the Bitcoin only company I'm working for, which is CoinBeast. Link to the full video and that CoinBeast YouTube channel will be in the description of today's video. And again, this clip actually comes from a little snippet uh, from a full interview that I was lucky enough to be a part of with Cedric over on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Highly recommend you check it out. He's had Michael Saylor, the Giga Chad, over on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, as well as all the big names in the Bitcoin space like Jeff Booth. Before we close this rip out, I'm going to throw another two videos up on screen that I think you'll probably enjoy if you made it this far into this video. And I'd like to quickly thank today's show sponsors, Bitbox O2 Hardware Wallet, the easiest hardware wallet there is in the space. Amber, guys, they're giving you $10 of free Bitcoin if you sign up using the Amber Exchange. Super easy to use. We just roll it out to 62 countries. Get around it. Great Bitcoin only company again. And of course, final show sponsor, Hodling Apparel, the best Bitcoin clothing brand there is in the space. Highly recommend you check them out and check out the video they're making because uh, they're they're traveling to El Salvador, Guatemala, all of these Bitcoin hotspots. And uh, they've got some really great videos they're putting out on their Instagram and their Twitter. So with all that said, Hope you guys have a good day and I'll see you all in the next video.